Welcome to Popcast Deluxe, your big things coming to LLC of weekly cultural review. I'm John Caramonica. I'm Joe Coscarelli. Uh, we are co-hosts of a spinoff of Popcast Original Recipe, which nytimes.com slash popcast uh, for those who aren't familiar. Um, every week, Joe and I will be coming to you with songs of the week, what's going on on social media, big news in music, television, etc. What else we got for the people? Snacks. I mean, first of all, it really took all the restraint that we had not to make this a full snack cast. Yeah. Just want to say that. Yep. But there will be snacks. Um, we are basically doing things that we can't exactly do on Popcast Regular. Popcast Regular, we take one or two big topics every episode. We're talking to outside experts. But there's a lot that we can't get to. This is going to be more of a rundown of the things that are happening every week out there in the industry, on the charts, on your phones. That's that's it. Yeah, B bonus oh. content. Prime. Also, we're on YouTube. That's oh yeah, the new. That's the main. New this thing. is what we look like. Yeah. In case you're unfamiliar, in case you haven't stopped us at the 100 Gek show, for example, right? A real thing that happened. Um. So this is what we look like. We'll be on YouTube.com. Uh. Every week we're gonna be coming. And uh, speaking of charts, YouTube stars, uh, success, controversy, controversy. Should we talk about Morgan Wallen? I think we have to talk about Morgan Wallen every, again. Yeah, it's yeah, like, every day. Yeah, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, Morgan Wallen persists in many different respects in our culture. Not all of them good, right? I think there's a lot to unpack with his continued dominance yeah. in the face of controversy after controversy. Let's talk about where we are right now. Recent Morgan Wallen album is called One Thing at a Time. Mm -hmm. 11 weeks at the top of the Billboard 200, which is, say, the most popular album in the country, owing to streaming success, country radio success. It goes on and on and on. Wallen also has the number one song in the country. Last night. Last night. Seven weeks at the top of the Billboard Hot 100, you know, holding at bay hits by... Everybody. Lil Dirk. Lil Dirk. Lil Dirk and J. Cole came out at number two this week behind Morgan Wallen. But Lil Dirk knows perfectly well. We're going to get to Lil Dirk and Morgan Wallen sure. in just a moment. If anybody knows the power of Morgan Wallen, it's Lil Dirk. Um, so let's actually give a little bit of a pricey of why this is unusual, right? So Morgan Wallen, when Dangerous, the double album came out, was captured on video by a neighbor after a raucous night out using a racial slur. TMZ picks this up, and the Morgan Wallen industry at that moment shuts down. He already had – his previous album was the biggest album out. It was the dawn of a new country pop superstar. Yes. He had everything going for him. He had recently hosted SNL, and then he's caught on video using a racial slur after a drunken night out. And, yes, the, the label says he's suspended – which like it's not a thing that it. music labels that do, but yeah. fine. Uh, radio radio stops playing the songs. Right. People stop writing about him. He's uninvited from award shows. It it came at a particularly heated moment where in like the the grand sort of racial reckoning uh, and Nashville specifically, sort of a town that is not historically uh, engaged with. Right racial politics in a way that would be understood as progressive and necessary. Right. And yet he just kept getting more popular. Yeah. And I want to say something about Morgan Wallen, the musician versus Morgan Wallen, the culture war hero. So later that year, Morgan Wallen did eventually get back out on the road. And I went to one of those shows. I actually went to two of those shows. Uh, Cause I wanted to see what that looked like. Yeah. And the thing that I was consistently struck by was Wallen was not the culture war soldier on stage. People saw that in him. People thought his ongoing success was really like sticking it to the man. Right. He became a poster boy for outlasting cancel culture. Yes. Basically. Right. And sort of country music loves its version of outlaws. And whether in the 70s, that's a, a different kind of outlaw, but really we're talking about the 2000s era outlaws, like your Toby Keiths of the world. Right. Country music is still like particularly like uh, riven through with that kind of energy, and the fan base, I think, really responds to it a lot. It's a conservative, it, 
culture tilts in that way. It tilts in a conservative direction. And so Wallen becoming kind of like a conservative hero, uh, I was not surprised to see that in the crowd. I was maybe expecting to see more of it on stage. Right. It's not on stage, or at least in that tour. He is currently sort of on a stadium tour. This is where we arrive today, right? Like Morgan Wallen selling out stadiums, the number one album in the country, the number one song in the country. Some percentage of that, I'm sure, is an energized fan base that wants to support him because it thinks that's what fighting cancel culture means. Right. But also Morgan Wallen is generally acknowledged to be a pretty good country musician who makes popular songs that people enjoy. Yes. So 60,000 people in a stadium is not simply It's not a only world. a backlash to the backlash. No. It's far bigger than that. And it's the arc that, frankly, he was on regardless. Now, all of this said, we're in an interesting moment for Morgan Wallen, right? Wallen uh, had a show in Mississippi. This was... Late April? Yes, maybe like, yeah. A couple weeks Three, four weeks ago. Yeah. Um, And uh, the opening acts play, and then all of a sudden, he burgers the show. Right. Burger. uh, Sex in the City burger. Carrie Bradshaw, ex-boyfriend. Burger broke up with me on a post-it. I'm I'm sorry. sorry, I I can't. can't. Don't hate me. That should be be our thing, is you and I saying. Quoting Sex in the City. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That should be our thing. Um, (laughs) Yeah. And then he no, put, yeah, he, so he puts he notes up, apt. He notes apt yeah. an apology. That was basically like, uh, I lost my voice. And there was some confusion or maybe misinformation or correct information that perhaps he had been drinking or had been out and about and carousing. And that's why he lost his voice. We don't exactly know. The public explanation is he lost his voice. Right. And then he canceled six more weeks of shows or postponed six more weeks of shows. In between, he played some shows. He yes. played a couple shows in Florida, I believe. Early May, he comes out with a statement. Everything's fair game in Florida, yeah. as, as you know. Fine. Saying that he'd injured his vocal cords and he was pausing what is, you know, one of the biggest tours of the year. Yeah, I mean, outside of the Taylor tour... It probably is the biggest tour of the year. I'm, I'm struggling to think of a, a tour that's bigger. Beyonce? Sure. Yeah. They're, up, they're up there. Right. Yeah. Um, a, 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 plus, plus, plus list superstars of popular music. Right. So Wallen's going to come back on the road uh, sometime in June, maybe, or, or July, one of the vocal cords heal up. To what degree do we feel like Wallen's consistent, uh, persistent success, what kind of problems does this pose? I feel like the question is, what will stop him? What can stop Morgan Wallen? Right. Like, he's tried... Should he be stopped? I'm not saying that he should be stopped. I'm just saying he got bigger. He comes back with a mea culpa album that's maybe a little bit worse than the previous one. Like, quality-wise? Yeah, I don't... I mean... Yes, I think it's a... As music, I think it's a very good album, but it is not as good as Dangerous the Double Album. And it's, what, like 30-plus songs? Yes. He's a streaming monster. It's a it's a, y, it's a YSL compilation album. It, in it, it is a NBA young boy length album. Morgan Wallen, Richest Op? Yes. Wow. Uh, and, and then he gets on the road, and the people who are not mad at him... So this means he's been, like, sort of written out of polite society, like left-leaning culture, coastal, elite, whatever you want to call them. But also sponsorships. Yes. Like, there's no Morgan Wallen at, he's not selling something. He's there's not no part songs. of the Grammy conversation. Songs aren't being synced in ads, even though they're the most popular songs, or at least not in ads on shows that I watch. Right, and then, and then he comes back and greets his public, the people who have not abandoned him, who have, in fact, rallied even more behind him. Yeah. And he basically, you know, again, maybe... Uh, Could be real. Yeah, vocal, whatever. He didn't treat his vocal cords well enough... To survive 30 weeks a on A stadium tour. Like, it's, you know, he's it's, it's like being... Work. Yeah, it's like being an elite athlete. Like, mm-hmm. you have to train to be able to put on the show that Correct. these people are paying their hard-earned money for. Correct. And so he, to see him basically let down... The audience that stuck with him. Yeah, the fans. The fans, his diehard fans. That's, for for him, that's way more dangerous than letting down the coastal elites. And yet, the, it, it, we haven't seen a slow, you know, he, he cancels this stadium show 
People were really upset. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like people who were there, you know, people cataloged all the money they lost, you know, all the dinner at Cracker Barrel, Airbnb, wanted, right, Airbnbs, Airbnbs and outfits, new boots. You know, people wanted to be reimbursed. They spent their, as their someone who buys a lot of money. boots. As someone who buys a lot of boots, like I want to register my sympathy with those people. I, I'm going to go ahead and say you've never bought boots for a Morgan Wallen concert. I haven't. You're right. I but, haven't, but I own yeah, plenty yeah. of boots. Yeah. Uh, and yet, the we have not seen any dip in the popularity of the music, and I wonder if it's a if it's a function of the way that celebrity works right now. Okay, which is that people don't really know who Morgan Wallen is. I don't think most people who are listening to Last Night, which is the biggest song in the country, seven weeks running, mm-hmm. I don't even know that it's all connected to the sort of controversies section on his Wikipedia. So you think almost there are people for whom Morgan Wallen is a character in a drama about how a country singer should behave in 2023, and then there are people who listen to the radio. Yes. And there's not that much overlap between those two groups. I think that's what you're saying. Yes. I think that he is benefiting from the fact that he is controversial in some circles, but he is not a famous person. No, He's not no. a famous personality. In part because of after what happened in 2021, obviously he did one relatively disastrous media appearance and then absolutely fell off the face of the earth. Right. Visually. Yeah. Doesn't really even get on Instagram that much. Doesn't really tell, st- you know, he's not posting a lot. There's not photos of him. You're not seeing him at events. Maybe his inner crew, like Ernest's and Hardy and all those people, they're his like songwriters, his yeah. opening acts, uh, his bands. Yeah, they're yeah. like, we're here with Morgan, et cetera. But, but you're right. There's no sense of like, what's Morgan like as an individual? Yeah, I could just get the sense that there's a, just a major disconnect. And it sort of mirrors, you know, what's happening in a lot of this country where you can be an artist and a culture war figure and they're not always overlapping you know what i mean like they 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 can there's two discrete versions of your persona i guess so i'm my question for you is what's next for morgan wall and like basically does he still have the runway to be garth brooks that's a okay well i don't think that i don't think that you can be garth brooks or taylor swift anymore i don't think it's exactly that What I do think about Wallen, or at least I think the question that him and the folks who work with him are probably going to have to reckon with is, if you go out every night at these shows, let's say the fans come back. I remember I I happened to be in Nashville uh, the day after this happened, and one thing that people in Nashville were saying was like, you know, you can let down the media, you can let down uh, the left, but you can't let down the fans. Right. Let's assume he comes back. Sure. Uh, But you go out every night and people are saying, let's go Brandon. Let's go Brandon. You know, USA chance at the concert, even at Madison Square Garden. Yes, which we we saw saw it with our own eyes. Yeah. Um, If you go out every night and you are seeing those fans, at what point do you start to play to those fans? At what point do you heel turn and be like, I'm going to become this guy because these are my most ardent loyal supporters now i'm not sure that wallen is at that um uh decision node where he's got to make that a decision one way or the other but i do wonder if after 50 nights on this tour assuming the tour picks back up seeing this and engaging with a version of this every night is he just going to go in that direction and and sort of be like well i am the villain y'all say i'm the villain i guess i am the villain that's i sort of wonder if that's what's coming and yet, what we hear from him musically... Drake. <laughs> is, like, so down the middle. Yeah. Like, okay, as Morgan Wallen is canceling this tour, he's also putting out his second collaboration with... Lil Durk. Chicago's own Lil Durk. Uh, the song is called Stand By Me. Yep. Uh, okay, well, first of all, the first song, Broadway Girls. Right. Broadway Girls comes about because at some point... Morgan Wallen posts a snippet of something when he's still like down, down bad. Yeah, in his in his canceled right. era. 
Lil Durk is in the comments being like, I'll get on this. Right. Uh, who knows how much Morgan Wallen uh, Lil Durk was listening to, but apparently uh, Unusual Bedfellows. Musical synergy. And Broadway Girls, uh, uh, you know, some people will not want to hear this. Broadway Girls, I think, is a pretty good song. Not my favorite by either of them. I, th- I like it. I think it's a good yeah. song. I've spent a lot of my life yeah. documenting the intersections between country and hip hop. Right. For it's better bo- or worse. It's to you. For better or worse, uh, I've lived that. I've lived that overlap for a long time. I thought it was like a pretty good song. Uh, I'm not sure what it did for either of them necessarily, but I thought as a song, I thought it was good. It was like a toe dip back in the ocean for Wallen, though, because and also Lil Durk then would go on to like be interviewed by TMZ and be like, if he's if I say he's not canceled, he's not canceled. Right. Morgan Wallen, whatever that. And again, good. cancellation. We're using that thing. as a shorthand. It is a shorthand. Yeah, and it worked. So they're doing it again. And now, who else have they brought on board? It's a Dr. Luke production. Uh, Dr. Luke has had some other issues of his own in regards to alleged uh, uh, impolitic and sexually aggressive behavior with Kesha. Yeah, still fighting it out in the courts. Mm -hmm. He's accused her of defamation after she accused him of sexually assaulting her Mm -hmm. many years ago. Still winding its way through the system. Yet Luke has come back in a huge way. And I think this song, which is actually on the new Lil Durk album. Lil Durk album. Uh, both, so- both songs are on the Both songs under Durk's name, yes. primarily. Which yes. is an, an interesting wrinkle. Yes. But I wonder if it's more evidence towards your theory that Wallen is going to lean into his heel turn to bring on Dr. Luke. Mm-hmm. Is it like a thumb in the eye of quote-unquote liberal media that won't cover Wallen to just say, well, you're also you're guy. also mad at this guy and we don't care? Or is it just I think we're trying to make a hit? I, I actually think it's darker in a weird way than that, which is purely cynical. I think it's basically like, what is the fastest path towards pop hit making? And if it happens to go through this guy, it happens to go through this guy. But if you listen to this song, this song is like much more aimed at like pop radio. Now, I don't know if pop radio would play, frankly, Lil Durk or Morgan Wallen on their own. But they both want it. They both seem to want it. And they have crafted a record that is extremely missile focused in that direction. Now, you can have a, a hit now. It's a streaming hit. That's not a radio. Broadway Girls was a streaming hit. It was like sort of a YouTube record. Yeah. It was not, to my knowledge, a radio hit in any format. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it was serviced to radio or not in any classic sense. Yeah. This seems like something that could be serviced to radio. Is it laundering Wallen in some way? Like, if he ends up getting serviced to radio to pop radio and becomes kind of like a pop radio sensation... Has that done some work to like untether him from the the sort of does that make him beat the the cancel culture allegations? But at the same time, it's like musically, it's laundering Lil Durk into it's pop laundering radio. both of them. Like there, it's not a great Wallen song. It's not a great Dirk song. It's the most sanded down version of each of them. Like we sort of had this moment with Lil Durk with "Laugh Now, Cry Later," his feature on the Drake song, which mm-hmm. was probably his biggest mainstream look so to far. that yep. point. But this is not a guy who is interested in making mathematically tight Dr. Luke style sure. music. Yeah. He's, he's loved for his sort of wild emotions mm-hmm. uh, and sort of like untamableness, yeah. right? Artistically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so to hear both of them in these boxes, it's like, it's it's quite kind of an unholy trinity. Although I will say, if it's the same exact song but the names are different, do you think that's a Z100 record? It's so generic that I'm like, I want to say no, but that probably means yes. Probably means yes. So a- again, it's, it'll be interesting to see where this goes over the course of the summer. It'll be interesting to see if the tour does in fact pick back up. Are fans going to reject it or has he lost some percentage of the fan base? And also, I think like the bigger conversation about like what is the role of a person like this as Nashville's biggest star and how does Nashville with their institutions, award shows, labels, uh, radio stations continue or not continue to reckon with this happening right in their midst? Just flat out, do you think this is a good song?
Yes. Okay. Ish. Seven point five. Oh, okay. Seven. All right. Seven point two. And you think it's gonna work? I think it's designed to work. Yes. Quote unquote. Without a doubt. I don't know if it'll work. Right. But it's designed to work. And I think whether it works or not will be an interesting litmus test of what spaces Morgan Wallen is allowed into. And to some degree, Lil Durk is permitted into. But, like, I do think it's probably a referendum on Wallen at this point, moment more than it is on Dirk. That's my guess. Speaking of scores. <laughs> I was going to say, the 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 way you were describing will this work from this sort of, like, microcosm. Like, this is happening This is happening on a smaller level with another artist who I know you want to talk about. Yeah, well, I, a lot of people want to talk about. Yeah. Or um, do they? Okay. Uh, every week on Popcast Deluxe, we are going to take a question, uh, a John and Joe question. This week, it being week one, uh, the John and Joe question is uh, came from the ether. Came from inside the it house. It came from inside the house. It came from upstairs. Yeah. Um, uh, Sam Sifton, who is in charge of the culture coverage here, went over to the desk of Karen Gans, our editor, and said, I, and I don't want to do a Sam accent, but, yeah, yeah. I, but like- You think Sam has an accent? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, kind of. I don't want to do it, but like I think in essence the question was, what's up with the dare? What is up with the dare? Which to be fair is a question that I have been asking, Joe has been asking, all of our dearest friends have been asking for eight months at yeah, this point, about, nine months. Yeah. Um, so the dare is Harrison Patrick Smith. It is a one individual project. Um, and the dare released a song last year called Girls. I like the girls that do drugs Girls with cigarettes in the back of the club Girls that hate cops and bad girls It's a great record to me. I know, I to me, it's a great record. It was on your, it was it on was your on songs of the year list. list. It was on yeah. my songs of the year list. Yeah. Um, girls is, depending who you ask, updated electro clash uh whatever indie sleaze might be we'll probably do an episode on that it's on indie sleaze because yeah. that's not real harrison might have to come for that one yeah seriously Defend harrison, himself. harrison's gonna be like splayed out like burt reynolds here yeah. during the indie sleaze episode uh someone suggested to me that uh it was basically a ripoff of cake wow yeah. i haven't heard that one. Oh yeah shout out you know who you are uh blog good blog game. house Sure, Blockhouse, yeah. LCD like, Sound System, yeah, The sure. Rapture, Dance Punk, Uffy, early 2000s. We were at the parties. I was at the parties. Turn of the, the century. Parties? I was. I got here in 2006. So you just kind of right I, at the tail end. Misshapes was happening. Yeah, you know yeah, what yeah. I mean? I think this is actually an interesting divide. I think people are failing to differentiate between Meet Me in the Bathroom, Alt, alt Rock. Not the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not the the Strokes. New York retro yep. garage rock moment. Yeah. And the sort of Cobra Snake, neon sunglasses. BPM is like high dance BPM. Music. One, yeah. 118, 122, 124 BPM. There were yep. people with feet in both worlds, but but one and sort the of, scenes are very nearby. And one led and into the, and the I other. would actually say some of the outfits in the early phases are are pretty similar. a lot of American apparel. Yeah, like it 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 peeled off at a certain yeah, point. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, yes, the pants are Marnie. Thank you for asking. <laughs> um, so the dare, <laughs> the dare uh, has an EP that came out, the Sex EP. Yes, uh, and there's a song called Sex, which yep. is very uh, spiritually kin to girls, but less funny. It's yes, I, I think, I think the dare is basically very good, and maybe should be even a tiny bit dumber. Okay, but we should pull back and say that we're fully in the midst of round one of backlash against the dare, which I think... Which, and I want to emphasize, more than likely, you have never heard of. Which is crazy, yes. To me, it boils down to this question, which is, does New York matter? And does New York matter more than culture being made in other places. Okay, so I want to I want to start by saying something that Bob Criscow once told me. Shout out Bob face to face. Yeah, uh, and and I think he says this in other contexts, but he did tell this to me. Tell me this face to face. Bob, 
been in the game for years and yeah. made him an animal. I just want to be clear. Bob said we were talking about covering live music in New York. And Bob has been doing this since the 70s. Right. The, the rock critic. Like literally the dean. Uh, and he was basically like playing a band playing in New York is news. It's noteworthy. Inherently, it's noteworthy. If you can make it here. Truly, it's like it. what is happening here, the scenes here, the venues, if you come from outside and play here, that's noteworthy. You have attention, you have people looking at you. If you come from here and you like come up through the scene, that's noteworthy. And I'm not saying there aren't noteworthy scenes in Cleveland or Dallas, Fargo. Like I'm not saying yep. any of that. But Bob said that to me. It has always stuck with me. Obviously, thinking about that in the CBGB 70s is different. I know, different it's an old school idea. It's an old school idea, but I do still think there is some residue, especially because, let's keep it a buck, most people who work in music media will probably live within a six-mile radius of where we're sitting right now. Do you think it's because stuff started here? Like, whatever, hip-hop, Broadway, punk. Sorry, punk. apologies to all British people. Would sure, disagree. but like... You know, not really. Don't, yeah. yeah. Like, we don't have to litigate our, that our, right our now. British But I'm saying, like, does that... Down after this. Like, the, the the fact that it's, like, a birthplace of culture means that any culture here is more I have, important I have, from the I jump? I have a more grim read on it, which is that the type of person who is likely to see themselves as having an important point of view are liable to be people who have arrived in New York and are looking for a thing that complements their arrival in New York. Right. That said, if I were to say to you, what's the dare of 2017? I'm not sure there was a dare of 2017. Mm -hmm. 2011, maybe 2003 for sure. But like, 2017 no maybe maybe that part of new york wasn't popping it's interesting though that the backlash that we're seeing you know i'm thinking of like a mid to negative review in pitchfork mm -hmm. uh, ne a negative-ish review in rolling stone mm -hmm. you know a lot of mean tweets like they're coming in from people who either live in new york or have spent time in new york who have watched this mini moment grow from its infancy mm -hmm. or saw the original saw the version original. of it uh, and yet there's still this like chip on the shoulder thing of like, we're not going to let this happen again. And I think some of that comes from the sort of dumbness that you described of the music, mm -hmm. which I think is intentional and he, he, but he hasn't, he hasn't really defined his character yet it's uh, still in, in the it's public. Right. There was a GQ story mm -hmm. that sort of scratched the surface, mm -hmm. uh, but he hasn't really announced himself and sort of what his ideologies are creatively. And yeah, it's like a straight white guy talking about sex in a way that feels to me distinctly post pandemic mm -hmm. and me too. And it's sort of mm -hmm. like, it's like the non-political, non-ideological version of like, we weren't supposed to be able to do this anymore. But it's still done with like a tiny sprinkle of irony. That's uh, no, I think bigger than a tiny sprinkle. Comedy, like, and I think is that the way that those topics are going to get kind of like uh, Trojan horsed back into the discourse, like through this sort of like right. I'm going to do the dumbest possible verse about sex, the dumbest possible, and actually, for the record, I don't think it's the dumbest possible. I think they <laughs> could be dumber, right? Um, but is that really what's happening here? Was it sort of, you think it's like idea first, execution second? I think maybe, but also it's so fledgling. Like people are really trying to strangle the dare in its crib, yep. you know? <laughs> and like, I, I almost think that that ultimately will make him stronger. Like people yeah. are gonna, oh, of course. like the backlash at this early stage, mm -hmm. I think is the best possible thing for the career. And I think that the mechanisms are already cranking signed to a major label performing at fashion weeks mm -hmm. being flown out by brands yep. you know working with different producer like getting in the studio mm -hmm. with so and so Looks like great all, in the suit yeah like yeah you know clothes are better like everything like it's 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 cranking so that's why i'm like it's a, i i'm not 
amenable to the argument that we shouldn't be covering this because it's just some tiny thing in New York. It's like, no, no, like the people with power have decided that this is a project that they care about. Like we've seen that, we've heard that, we've been hearing this chatter for months. You know, these are how scenes are built. Like label guys are not geniuses, but what they say goes. (laughs) You know what I mean? I'm like, they decide what culture gets to spread. Okay, uh, I feel like the words that you're trying to say, but you're failing to say, are Matty Healy. <laughs> I feel like that's where, it, like, like you want to talk about someone Trojan horsing ideas into post Me Too culture, like with their popularity and causing quite a conflagration. Yeah, should I say we're gonna say we're like gonna... where where are we like how long before the dare is Matty Healy discourse level? If they are not in the studio together by the end of the summer, I will be by surprised. The this, by the end of this podcast, they will right. be. Uh, we did it. Look, I'm just saying we did it for Taylor and Ice Spice. It's true. We did that. We spoke it into being. We did that. Um, I think Maddie and Harrison would have a lot to talk about musically and culturally. And we're just going to leave it there. And then when that happens six to 12 months from now, we're going to cut this in right there. And we'll talk about it some more. All right, you want to talk about other things that happened in New York and have happened over the years? Your early career, Joey Blogs. Oh, oh, okay. All right, we're gonna we're gonna shift. We're yeah, gonna yeah, shift topics. Course. We're gonna Unless shift you, mediums. Yeah, Be, but we're not. But again, you want to talk about the indie sleaze of media? It's true. Joey Blogs. Yeah, literally. Yep. The Gawker era. Um, can you talk to me about what it was like to be young and watching this? Like, I sort of like I don't know if I lived it, but I was like there. I saw it was like, you know, yeah. I felt like a... But you were a grown-up. <laughs> debatable. <laughs> but I was, I was of age. But <laughs> whether I was a grown-up was debatable. Um, you're watching this a little bit and almost like learning how to yeah. creatively contribute to the media through that lens, not simply through the lens of magazines and newspapers and so on and so forth. Yeah, so we're, we're talking about this new movie, Queen Maker. Queen Maker's on Hulu. On Hulu. And, and Queen Maker is in part about how the early gossip blog era was intertwined with the arrival of, I guess, the modern socialite. Yeah, it's sort of, it's the thesis statement. It's like about it girls, socialites, but then narrows down to be about a much more specific story, which yes. I think is really interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but could you talk about the era? A yeah, little bit. I mean the lawlessness of the era. So it was partially what drew me to New York in the first place, which is like being able to go to write on, about the dare. Yeah, to write about the <laughs> to, no to podcast <laughs> on uh, YouTube dude, about the dare. <laughs> Here's the thing: <laughs> Joe was so ahead <laughs> that he came in. What year did you come to New York? 2006. 2006. Summer 2006. You came here. Two, you waited 17 years. <laughs> To YouTube bot about the dare. It's incredible. What a patient guy. So patient. Uh, Harrison was literally in his crib at You're that point truly, when I moved to New York. Knew. You knew. Um, yeah, no, but there was there was this wave of unofficial sort of like guerrilla media and celebrity happening. Yes. Um, the documentary Queen Makers uh, sort of like literally just never, t- never take me to scratch or bar again. Well, yeah, when was the last time you were in Scratcher? Actually, not that long ago, yeah. but like never, I never, like never take me there. Yeah, um, I went to Scratcher last night. No, you didn't. I did after I saw a movie at Angelica Film Center. Truly, just in- like it was two thousand. Literally, literally, Indie Sleeves lives. Yeah. Um, okay. The documentary jumps pretty quickly from the Hilton sisters mm-hmm. to Tinsley Mortimer mm-hmm. to. Olivia Palermo and Gawk. No, frankly, not enough in Olivia Palermo. Yeah. If we're gonna keep it a buck, though, I need. Though she is interviewed, she is interviewed, and 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 I think I like I like her resistance. I like how she doesn't want to be there. She doesn't want to be like she's unhappy. Yeah. She's like I almost like can't believe I agreed to do this. Yeah, it's not like the vibe. Like it's like she sat down and she was just like ah oh, the vibes off, but yeah. like I'm here. I did the like I did the hair and makeup. Like let's just get through this. Yeah. Anyway, more Olivia Palermo. I'd like to see that the bonus footage. Right yeah, now. and I think that this world started in the traditional gossip pages, page six, mm-hmm. New York Post, and then the meta version, which was springing up. 
is the Gawker Medias of the world, the Socialite Rank website. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the other one called? Park Avenue Peerage. Park Avenue Peerage. Uh, and these are people with no training, no bosses, mm -hmm. really, that can say whatever they want, be as mean as they want. Some are anonymous, some are not. This is the rise of Perez Hilton. Mm -hmm. All this, this was exci an exciting time. This was like a democratization of... The press. So you say. So I said. I mean, yeah. like, for somebody coming up at that time, mm -hmm. Live Journal, MySpace, Blogspot, WordPress, mm -hmm. Tumblr, and so on and so on. Like RSS on Fleet. Yeah. I mean, this was like a lot of this, like, and this movie, this documentary tells that story in the background. Uh, and I thought it did an okay job at it mm -hmm. i thought it was a little bit a historical like the recent new york magazine package on the it girl mm -hmm. i think had a wider longer deeper view this is sort of like fast forwarded through it but it felt like it was fast forwarding through it in order to get to its real subject yeah and so i'm curious did the film work for you once it at sort of the halfway point reaches what I think is the story that it really wanted to tell. I thought the second half of the film, which focuses on the person who created Park Avenue Peerage, Park Avenue Peerage was a sort of affectionate document, uh, an affectionate document of socialite culture. Right, from afar. From afar, written by- You won't a, spoil it. No. You should watch the movie. That are you recommending it or are you not recommending? I if, am recommending. If it. you know who oh, Olivia no, no. Palermo is, you should watch the movie. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I'm not saying we. I'm, I'm saying eh, maybe we should spoil it, spoil it a little uh, bit. No, I don't think so. We're are we a spoiler it's podcast. For, it's like been out two weeks. I just don't. Uh, you know. All right, all right. It was spoiled for me before I watched it. You let me come to the twist on my own. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the person who uh, did Park Avenue Peerage which was the sort of like affectionate socialite rank. Socialite rank had been seen as caustic and yeah. pitting people against each other. Snarky and, was the word of the time. Wow. Wow. I'm going to get you a snarky, like a varsity type yeah. uh, sweatshirt. Yeah. Snark. Yeah. Uh, snarky you. Um, uh, that person has undergone uh, tremendous life changes. Yeah. Uh, and the second half of the film is devoted to those tremendous life changes. Um, and and the ways in which the heartbreak of the first era led to these tremendous life changes. Um, I thought the story in the second half of the film is a better story. I thought the film was not as good. Mm. I thought the film was better in the beginning, in the first half, even if the story of the first half is like not quite as good. Yeah, I think this is, it's such a rich topic, and I think it's worth it to give it the sort of catchy framing of Paris Hilton and the It Girls to be able to tell this very specific tale of, yeah, how this world sort of shaped someone's imagination from afar and then was able to enter that realm and sort of, sort of and, and how it, but also the ways in which that world is not set up to accommodate difference. Yes. Not set up to accommodate racial difference, not set up to accommodate class difference, like not set up to accommodate. Um, uh, just like it is the most insider outsider place that you can possibly imagine. And it was interesting to see how quickly it all crumbled. The minute that that person comes to New York the city yep. interns at New York, the magazine yep. and starts trying to go to these events. And all of a sudden the whole thing kind of like, crumbles. yeah, I think. And without, and without giving away too much about the twist, the concluding scene of the film is I think meant to be meant to literalize something that could not have been literalized back in 2006 or whatever, which is there is a novelty to that person going to one of those events in 2006 in 2021 or yeah. 2022, two things are happening. One, this per I'm, I'm going to spoil one part. This person never actually makes it in the door of the event to recreate the moment of meeting Tinsley Mortimer, which was like a yeah. foundational moment in the first wave. Yeah. The second thing that I think went unremarked upon is looked how desiccated that event felt. That it's event true. is in Chicago. I apologize. It's not in New York. It's in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm sorry. We know. I, I like. Look, I, I enjoy Chicago. I've I don't. Had a great. I had a great time. Shout out George Green. 
happy to, you know, great times. Yeah. Um, it's in Chicago. It is for dog. It's it's an event for people in their for dogs, up yeah, pets. actual dogs. Yeah. Literally, it's for dressed up pets. Yeah. So it's like people have gone through a lot of life changes. People have evolved. People have maybe fallen from their perches or their perches have moved. It is not simply the blogger's perch that has moved. It is also the socialized yeah. perch. I think that it's a really fascinating document of a niche but influential time. I think oh, yeah. recommend it to fans of Gossip Girl. If you know who Emily Gould is, you should watch Friend this. of the pod. Shout out Emily Gould. If, uh, who, and also, can I say something about the Emily Gould bit in yeah. there? I had not watched the CNN Jimmy Kimmel like face off right. probably since With it happened. Gawker since. blogger, former Gawker blogger Emily Gould. Right. A sort of going on the Larry King show yeah. guest hosted by Jimmy Kimmel. Uh, to defend Gawker, basically. And defend Gawker Stalker, yeah. which at that time was basically like, oh. It I, was the original Dumois. Yes, literally. Like, now we don't even think about it. Like, yeah. uh, But it's literally like, oh, I saw Joe Coscarelli. Spotted Joe Biden, at, Washington, D.C. <laughs> yes, like literally <laughs> like that. Uh, and so she ends up being the, the face of Gawker and Gawker Stalker. And then Jimmy Kimmel, like, sort of, like, lures her in. And then it's basically like, by the way, you're a terrible person. I'm not drunk in public, yada, yada, yada. Honestly, I think that there's a shifting definition of what is public and what is private space for everyone, not just celebrities. The internet, blogs, MySpace, no one has the reasonable expectation of being able to walk down the street and not have what they're doing be noticed by someone Well, anymore. that's just, that is just the terrible thing, though, isn't it? I mean, just Is it really? I thought the way that Emily discussed the, pres the end of the presumption of the average person's privacy is very prophetic mm. and even i think in the most generous read of how that clip played out in 2000 whatever i think that part never quite got the play it was more mm -hmm. kimmel being like T -t 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 -t. yeah it was the That's, it was the ambush yeah but like i actually thought and that part her defense of it yeah comes late in the clip mm. and i actually thought it was really admirable to kind of be like i just eating all this ah, this this stew that's getting thrown at me by the host for four minutes and then to sort of have this very robust defense of something that look i'm sure we all don't like it like nobody likes to be like talked about in a way that they're not expecting sure but it, it is unfortunately a fact of the modern internet and certainly you know i mean we're now at the point where we're having ethics debates about like can you photograph someone on the train and right. put it on tiktok etc cetera, etc cetera. right like or at a baseball game at a baseball game um, and so I thought seeing that clip now with fresh eyes and with 15 years of perspective was actually quite prophetic. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think people should check out this movie if, if you care at all about any of the proper nouns we've or said us. in the last five minutes. If you care about Joe, if you, if you yeah. ever went on JoeCoscarelli.com, still <laughs> active, by the way, if you ever went on JoeCoscarelli.com or ever clicked through a link on JoeCoscarelli.com yeah. to a John Caramonica article, yeah. if you ever did that. It's probably how we met. I, I almost certainly yeah. yeah so uh you should check out the film absolutely um should we talk about one other tv thing yeah what else have you been watching well i mean i, th I mean here we sit. there was only one thing to watch last night <sighs> speaking of the early 2000s uh both joe and i are big survivor heads yeah um survivor finale survivor all right just i just want to get this out of the way Yes, Survivor. You explain what Survivor is. Yes, Survivor is still on. Yes, yes, it's on. It's forty fourth, fourth season. Season forty four. Season forty four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. forty four season Survivor. It has never gone away since. I know you remember Richard Hatch. Yeah, you, it's you never know, gone bad. It's never. It's mm, there's some duds, but never a long stretch. Although mm -hmm. this most recent stretch, I think, was really struggling until this season. It's a really good season. Finale of forty four last night. Mm -hmm. We're gonna spoil it. Yeah, why are we spoiling this but not the other thing? Because uh, one was a live television event and one is a streaming film that it, that has much less juice than primetime on CBS. Okay, we're going to revisit the no-spoiler yeah. policy at some point because <laughs> uh, I think it's fine to spoil. And I think if you show up here and you're just like, if you're going to send a yeah. whiny email about spoiling, yeah. then like, you're not for us and we're not for you. It's uh, okay. <laughs> it's totally fine. Choose your right size your audience. It's true. It's totally fine. Uh, How did you feel after last night? Jam Jam won. Yeah, I am not surprised. Yeah, I was. I was. I thought it was obviously very smart of them. Okay, so what ended up happening 
is there were three people who were sort of outcasts. Uh, they were on the sort of least powerful tribe, and frankly, amongst themselves, we're talking Carolyn, Jam Jam, and Carson. Yep. Each of whom, in their own, a classic kind of like survivor archetype on their own. That's the main thing I want that's yeah. that struck me about this season and that was lacking in the last couple mm -hmm. is that on any other survivor season, any one of them would have been the star. Yes. Survivor has been so good, like the bachelor, real world. Mm -hmm sort of the challenge like yeah, yeah. at birthing its own mythology and its own recurring characters yeah, yeah. and we've been sorely lacking in classic survivor Archetype repeat characters, player yeah, yeah. all-stars they'll definitely come back you know what i mean Absolutely. like people who are who the moment you see them you're like you are now part of the survivor lore lore this is lore yes and any one of we could have done with any one of them. We yeah. got three in one season, and which the fact is that they, incredible. And the fact that they were on the same tribe, that they worked together in an old school alliance, in an old school alliance successfully. When frankly, all three of them are unstable in different ways. Yeah, like Carson is unstable because he's so analytical that he's liable to look at his alliance and say. Absolutely not. Yeah. Now's the time to X these people out. Yeah. Jam Jam's unstable because his social game is so good. He's, he's friends really with everyone. Friends with everybody, yeah. allied with everybody. The odds that he's going to stay true to his core alliance, not that high. Yeah. Carolyn, unstable because played just a very unpredictable, emotionally uh, vulnerable, and transparent game to the on point purpose. where nobody, on purpose, but, but people. What's what people had some difficulty identifying where the gameplay was, yeah. And I think that's what she was trying to argue for. But I also think it's why she didn't get any votes in the end. I couldn't believe it. I, I thought you thought she was gonna win. I thought I was watching, I, I think I let my heart get the best of me. Oh. I thought we were watching Carolyn's story the entire run my entire life people are constantly saying carolyn's kind of loud carolyn's a little bit crazy carolyn's a little emotional but i am coming out here as somebody who loves and accepts myself i was like oh she's taking it like that i was like they know that we're the producers are as in are as in love in with her bag, as the yeah. audience and oh, like that's so funny and i and Oh. Again, like I Jam believe, Jam, it's, it's tells it tells me a lot about you that you thought that that's what was happening with the Carolyn arc of this season. And I just thought she would be able to convey to everyone that while she seemed like a mess, she was really in total control. Yeah. She made a couple moves throughout the season that I didn't think she had in her, and she used playing the idol for Carson. Yes, yep. and she used her outward kookiness to throw everybody off the uh -huh. scent. Absolutely. She was always a threat, and nobody ever named her as a threat. To me, the reason I felt like I, I felt fairly confident. I mean, I thought it was being Carson or Jam Jam, but like when they got rid but of Carson, Carson didn't even make the final. Th yeah, he right. lost in the fire making. Right, but like when I, the got reason I washed was, by Heidi, like it wasn't even <laughs> like Carson did so much crying early in the episode about his failure to make fire. I actually thought talk about a redemption arc. I was like, oh, he's definitely winning fire. Oh, like I thought they were setting yeah, him up yeah. to overcome. Yeah, and actually they were just setting him up to be like, yep. No, Heidi Wild is just trash. like I, I mean, no. bless her. She wasn't. She was never gonna win. The she, whole thing. Yeah, the, she was. It was. Uh, she was never gonna win the the show. Mm -hmm. Crazy that she got to the end. Mm -hmm. Fine character. Mm -hmm. Sort of a. You know, Just, she was a placeholder. Yeah, yeah a, new, a new, relatively neutral. Yeah, but you thought you thought Carson. If if Carson would have won fire, you think you would have won? I think Carson absolutely would have yeah. won. Um, the thing about Jam Jam and over the course of the season, you following Carolyn, I'm following Jam Jam. The reason is because I kept waiting for. him him to be a villain right he was not and i think a truly good person maybe and, and also i kept i felt like the producers kept waiting for him to be a villain and they were stitching together just the faintest little things mm -hmm. little throwaway sentences here and there to make him seem like he actually is going to stab people in the back but every time he was presented mm -hmm. with an opportunity to stab someone truly close to him in the back he just said I can't do it. Josh, the person I'm trying to take out, he said Kane as a vote, which is a great idea. You know, but I like Kane. I don't want to write Kane's name down. It's not in my He's heart. He's a big softie. Not, yeah, like truly. Yeah. And so once he made it into the final three, I was like, there's no universe in which he doesn't win. I mean, he was the most popular person uh, in the tri in this tribe. He's like, going to be the new Jeff Probst. Yeah. Like when Probst retires... It's Jam Jam. In all he's gonna be time, the, he's gonna orator. be the Ken Jennings. He's yeah. the Ken Jennings yes. of future survivors. Totally possible. Beyond winning, so funny, so warm, so charming. Deserved his win. 
think. Jam Jam, yeah, we might have to pull Jam Jam. Yeah, I mean, come Jam Jam, out. come on Popcast Deluxe anytime. The da- like, we're going to have the dare one week, Jam <laughs> Jam the next week. <laughs> and nobody's going to understand no what's going on. Uh, all, uh, if you've made it this far and you haven't watched Survivor since the Season glory four. days, yeah, yeah. like, get involved. Just go Tap watch in. the whole thing. Survivor yeah. is the most, it's, it's nourishing. It's yeah. amazing. It's yeah, wonderful. Yeah. It's some of the best documentary. Mm-hmm. made of our yeah, yeah. in our lifetime mm-hmm. it's it, to me it's probably the second best show of all time after sopranos oh succession just kidding yeah. <laughs> um i think that's interesting also i think you know cbs had a mandate a few years ago to improve diversity right. in the casting i think they've done a really good job uh spreading out the cast i think i think they always did a good job identifying good emotional characters yeah. and now they've Finally, I mean, like a double feat down of casting really, survivor really impressive. O- throughout its whole also, history. Also, Jeff Probst, like put him in the Hall of Fame, <sighs> put him absolutely in the Hall of Fame. So folk, like so, like so present, so present. Forty four seasons, man, never slipped. What a titan, a titan. Um, all right, we're also gonna do every week. We're gonna do songs of the week. We're gonna pivot away from Survivor. Um. Um, all right, we're gonna, we're both gonna do songs of the week. Okay, right? You want to yeah. go first? You want me to go first? You you give me what you got. Okay. Um, I listen to a lot of Young Boy. There's so much to listen to. It's like I it's like um it's like Jandek. So I'm like five know. albums behind. Yeah, and you just like and I listen. Possibly, I actively listen to you NBA like Young literally Boy. just couldn't yeah. possibly absorb it all. Um, but I was listening to Richest Stop, the newest album. Yeah, newest album. Uh, I was listening to it in the car the other day, and there's a, a song on there called dirty thug and the reasons that i and many others love i mean young boy the most popular artist on youtube like not like maybe bad bunny is more popular but basically yeah, yeah. the most a, popular a humongous a humongous star that artist. most people yeah, yeah. Who people don't a lot of people don't know about but yeah. he's huge has such like a direct line to like um a raw emotional expression um the songs really do feel the, the basically like when I try to write something, like I try to clear out the path from the brain to my fingers. Yeah, he's whatever he's that is. Of that. He's yeah. just incredibly. It's so quick and lucid, and you feel the immediacy of it, but it doesn't take away from the structuredness of it. He's still they're still well structured songs. Yeah, but they feel immediate, and I believe based on everything you ever heard or seen about his recording approach yeah. and his output level. I imagine that's because they are. Yeah. Um, and something about the vocal on this song, which we should just listen to for a second, but something about the vocal right at the top of this song, just real like every now and then he just can really it just punch. It's it's overwhelming. Take these drugs with no party. I told that girl that I'm sorry. I seen what was said and it scarred me. That's what got me acting this way. But the fuck, I can't get mad. They love, I ain't enough. I'ma try and find happiness in myself. I lost my trust. So anyway, no angel and that girl, I lost my love. Yeah. So anyway, that's that is the song. I, I find in in certain contexts when people ask me how do I find music or how do I like approach thinking about music critically, which I've been doing for an unbearably long period of time <laughs> of my life since I was on Tumblr since <laughs> since before I was on Tumblr since Joe was thinking about YouTubing about the dare <laughs> when Joe is in the crib, um, I, I, a thing that I say is I like to be jolted. Yeah. And and oftentimes... Especially what today. Like yeah. In this moment. Yeah, so much. Everything is like a little bit fuzzy. I like to be jolted. Um, and often what I mean is I want to be jolted by an idea or a, a an ideology that I haven't heard before or a perspective. But sometimes you get jolted. I mean, you know, I'm not going to be here like Sam Cooke, a change is going to come. Right. NBA young boy. Dirty Thug, like, I'm not going to do that. But, like, sometimes a vocal hits in such a pure way that it destabilizes you. 
that's out. Like when this came on in the car, like I was like, yeah, you had to stop and listen. Very, yeah, very what, intense. What more could you want? Physical reaction out of music. Sentiment. Yeah. Um, speaking of jolts, and also speaking of the endless vomit stream of contemporary pop culture, it's true. Um, my song of the week: New Old Lana Del Rey. New Old Lana. Say yes to heaven. Yeah. Sped up version. Okay. Official re- official release. Official. This is this is as good to me uh, from a music business angle as it is yeah. from an artistic side, which is this is a Lana Del Rey song that has nothing to do with the album that Lana Del Rey just put out. It is an old leak right. from a decade ago yeah. mm-hmm. that has always had some... Uh, it's like a connoisseur mythology, record. yeah. yeah it's like a connoisseur like record. A Lana fans, like young boy fans, collect leaks. They yep. connect, collect slip snippets. They wish for these songs that they're that are never going to come out officially. But I think this one got a little bit of heat on TikTok, whatever. Lana and the label get together and they say, you know what, we're going to put out "Say Yes to Heaven," and we're also going to package it with a sped up remix version. You talked about sped up remixes on regular podcasts. This on regular week, podcasts. Elias from Billboard came on. Uh, we were talking about the Miguel Shore thing record, yeah. Thundercat record. Yeah. Um, so fast remixes, just uh, the short version. Fast remixes on TikTok have become a thing, probably just because everybody has ADD and like needs to hear things either quickly or also yeah. uh, at a pitch that kind of like you're like, what? Yeah. Or why is that voice like that? Um, it's an attention getting device. Uh, it also like is an interesting complement for different kinds of choreography, different kinds of jump cuts. Sometimes Com- it dodges robots that try to take down copyright yeah, of course. Yeah, songs. There, it like there's the bots. a yeah, there's like a sort of until uh, the bots absorb the official right. versions. Right. So anyway, if you want to hear more about sped up remixes, if you listen to original podcast, we've got an hour on there talking about how labels are coping, how artists are coping, et cetera. But it's interesting to see someone like Lana, who I would imagine is like pretty precious about the art. Yes. Kind of be like, yeah, pitch it up 30%. Do it. Whatever. Just go. So she's chipmunked up on this song. The song really works for me. I'm not like a sped up remix guy. Like it's not something that I'm spending a lot of time listening to, but for it's funny. Right. But Lana is a slow core artist in a lot of ways. Yeah, of course. So. But this is back in a time when she was still writing tighter, pop-oriented mm-hmm. songs. And then to add another layer of, like, pop beamed in from 10 years later onto it. Like, I just think it's a really interesting artifact, um, but it also works for me on a musical level. So, And also, I should say, like, one thing TikTok does really well, intentionally or not, is it really just does collapse the idea of history. Yeah. It's like it genuinely doesn't matter. Yeah. Like is it new? Is it old? Is it supposed to sound like this? And is who, it not? Truly, who knows? Yeah. Uh, one thing that came up on podcast is some executive said to Elias uh, uh, for a story that he was working on, like, are we, like, making songs or are we just, like, giving clay? To people and then they do what they want and it's like i regret to inform you y'all are clay uh let's you want to listen yeah it's clay let's go it's good clay it's good clay finish up i mean first of all i promise i will never stop going in is it time for dessert (sighs) i like to lead with dessert but yeah all right uh one other thing we're gonna close out every episode joe and i are both uh i would say devoted snack connoisseurs yeah we have different palates we have different tolerances Mm -hmm. for flavor spice texture but uh, but we love junk food. We love junk food, and I will be at a corner store. I'll be at a bodega, and I will see something novel, and I'll take a picture of it and send it to Joe. And Joe will be like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I got it first. I already been there. Um, so I brought something, but actually I think we're, we're going to save this for right. next episode because I think this is the logical 
answer yeah. to what we're about to This have. is not available at bodegas. Not yet. This is banana bread with chocolate chips, it looks like. Cooked by, baked by, baked by yeah, you, I, the one and only Karen Gans, our editor, frequent guest on PopCast. Yes. This is a, a housewarming gift for PopCast a lot. Yeah. And I already know it's delicious. I would never say otherwise. Uh-oh. So I have to say otherwise <laughs> is what you're saying? Do you like banana bread? This yeah, is really sure. Is that, are there walnuts in here, though? Uh, yes. That's not there, or there's walnuts on top. I don't know if they're inside. You don't eat walnuts? I'm, mm. Wow, it's soft. Mm. Really soft. Mm-hmm. Good job. Good job on texture. <laughs> you going Paul Hollywood on us? Yeah. Karen did it. It's hitting. Karen, you did that. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. I'm not saying I thought it would not be this good. It's really good. But I thought it would not be this good. Yeah. Like, truly. Every now and then, in an extremely low moment, I'll go to Starbucks, and I'll get a piece of banana bread. That's dark. And they warm it up for you. <laughs> Even still. <laughs> this is better. Karen, felicidad. Yeah. Like, truly great. Incredible. Truly great. Thank um, you. Episode one, Popcast Deluxe in the Books. You're Joe Coscarelli. John Caramonica. Uh, look, catch us every week, youtube.com slash NY Times or NYT Audio, wherever we're going to end up being. Listen to podcast, all versions, audio only and video slash audio uh, at nytimes.com slash podcast. Email us at podcast at nytimes.com. Get in the Facebook, get in the Discord, tinyurl.com slash podcast Facebook slash podcast Discord. If you want a sticker, should I? We got stickers. If you like Cameron's Purple Haze and you like stickers and you want to put things on your laptop, it's the popcast.myshopify.com. Profits go to the New York Times Neediest Cases Fund. Uh, Leslie Davis is our director and producer. Uh, Pedro Rosado handling all of our audio on the audio feed. Karen Gans, of course, Nell Galogli. The video team here that has allowed us into their space and made this uh, a comfortable environment for us. I'm talking Abe Sater. I'm talking Mike Cordero. I'm talking Craig Hedich. I think you got it. Episode one in the books. Popcast Deluxe. Come back next week. Big things coming.